Roberts College from a federal prison. It's hard for me to sit here and justify in my head seven life sentences because someone said I was a drug dealer. All of the money and the drugs that they had in the courtroom, none of that belonged to me. They had no tapes, not even a fingerprint of mine. They had nothing. And they made that into where they could take millions of legal money from me. Money that I acquired from representing Mike Tyson, the game, Wyclef, from doing movies. For 20 years I've been in the music business. For y'all to come take my property, to take my money, to take everything that I've worked for, to take my life, is ridiculous. And I am in shock that the justice system even works that way. I believe I went into that courtroom in front of the prosecutors who were already guilty. It wasn't about the fact finding of the truth. This was about convicting Jimmy Hendrix. On the morning of May 14, 2012, in the federal courthouse in Brooklyn, New York, the assistant prosecuting attorney gave her opening statement against James Rosemond. She set out to prove that Jimmy was the leader of a multi-million dollar drug ring, that he was the sole kingpin, the mastermind of an organization that trafficked hundreds of kilos a month and employed dozens of people. She continued to describe Jimmy's lavish lifestyle to the 14-person jury, clearly painting the picture that Jimmy had a lot of money and that he lived a life of luxury. Almost as an afterthought, she mentioned Jimmy was the CEO of a music company. His music career was just a footnote in the summation of his criminal life. And why wouldn't it be? In the eyes of the prosecutors, Jimmy's music business was nothing more than a front. It was unbelievable to these people that I was doing business the right way. In their brain, Jimmy Rosemont, the guy that we know, who knows gangsters all over the country, they could not believe that I was making millions of dollars a year, legitimately. Let's call it from a federal prison. 1996. 31 years old at that point. Goof Theory's on tour. I stay out in LA for a little while. By all standards, it appeared Jimmy's early success with Groove Theory and Salt and Peppa was fortuitous at best. He was still a wanted felon who had one foot in the music industry and one foot in the streets. It was very uncomfortable out there. I remember having a conversation with Biggie, Nas, Jay Z, and any other East Coast rapper that I would run into. I said, listen, man, y'all going on the West Coast, man, be careful. For them dudes is looking to make an example out of somebody. I always had to have a firearm out there. I wasn't out there to start no trouble, but it was the environment that Pac sold to these guys that all of us East Coast guys conspired against him. I was afraid that those guys would try to make an example of me. And so because of that, I used to have to carry. I'm at my hotel in Hollywood. I stay there all the time. I know all of the workers. I notice that the front desk guy is different, but he, he's looking at me. I hear walkie-talkies when I'm walking past one of the rooms. I go into my room, and I notice that all of the shades are pulled back. And I'm like, uh, something don't feel right. I'm getting ready for bed, and I'm looking under the door in the hallway, and I'm seeing a lot of shadows. When I look through the people, I don't see anything. So I crack the door a little bit, and they got their machine guns out, and they tell me that they get on my knees and don't move, so I, I get arrested. Jimmy had been on the run for five years, and that day, Los Angeles police had been tipped off about who he was and his whereabouts. They said that an uh, informant had told them that I was in the hotel. My belief is 
Authorities then sent Jimmy to North Carolina to face the drug conspiracy charges he had been eluding since 1991. He was sentenced to 16 months in North Carolina and an additional two years in Rikers Island from a 1993 gun possession charge that he fled from when he was out on bail. If Jimmy was just a thug merely pretending to be in the music industry, his circumstances would have been the end of his career. People in the industry is asking me to call them and they're like, hey man, I have a problem. You know so-and-so, I'm trying to do a deal with them. Can you help me with that? And I'm like, yo, I'm in jail. People started coming to visit me, like just telling me they problems. Most of the people that they were having problems with was guys who was phone calls away from me. So I would make the call, I would fix the situation, and I just became that go-to guy that people would come to. I had deals with Universal and Def Jam. They were giving me production deals. I was making money while I was in jail. It was amazing to me. While in prison, Jimmy was able to maintain his professional relationships. And in 1999, former heavyweight boxing champion Mike Tyson spent 200000 on a lawyer who helped get Jimmy released from Rikers Island. This is where the fork in the road comes into my life. I remember my lawyer looking at me and saying, Jimmy, you have a new lease on life. Although not completely rid of his legal problems, Jimmy started working with Barry Hankerson, the founder of Black Round Records and the uncle of pop star Aaliyah. I'm working for Barry Hankerson and Barry looks at me and says, I got two weeks to finish Romeo Must Die soundtrack. Can you help me with this? I call in all my favors to Jay-Z, Destiny Child, Memphis Bleak, Beanie Siegel. We do the album in two weeks. Try Again is Aaliyah's first single off of it. And out the gate of me coming home, I got a platinum soundtrack. Two, three months later, Barry says, I'm doing exit You Think you can do the same thing again for me? I said, no problem, Barry. And there's no stopping me. I was doing deals left and right. I was on the payroll of about four or five different record companies. I had t and &E, travel and expense with two or three different companies. I was rolling. With Henchman Entertainment, Jimmy was finding the talent and then going and doing deals with different labels so that you could have different artists at different companies. In the 90s, the industry was just busy snatching talent and gambling on any artist here or there if they had a spark. So there was money everywhere. The average production company was a 50-50 split. If the artist made a million dollars, the production company would make $500,000. Some guys, even today in the street, can't believe if they knew me from when I was a kid. We know you. How are you able to do this? That was almost impossible for guys to understand. Listen, I was terrible as a kid. Hands down. All I ever did was channel all of that messed up negative energy that I had into this. I admired him. I looked up to him as someone from the streets of my neighborhood who had made a name for themselves in entertainment, which I was aspiring to be successful in. I pounded on everybody's door that it, it was like if you knew a guy who knew a guy who knew a guy who knew Jimmy I'd knock on your door and ask you can you please get this note and ask him to set a meeting up so I could beg him to be my manager. I would definitely say that Jimmy was instrumental in helping me get my foot off the ground. Kind of took me under his wing and just took me to the meetings and stuff and he was working on Sugar originally known as Sweet Tea. My song is a second single and it was called What's Up Star. Placing that song on that soundtrack was a big deal for me because I hadn't reached that stature at the time. Jimmy was cool. He, he was a man of his word. When he said he was going to do something, he would do it. I think Jimmy had a great reputation with his peers. Everybody that I know that encountered him loved him. Jimmy was known to be a man about his business, about his money. He had great relationships, and he understood the music business, and he did some great deals. You had a bunch of street guys who was trying to follow my formula, 
but really couldn't because everybody who I was involved with before 96 when I got arrested is in position now. Chris Lighty is a big manager. Steve Stout is a big executive. Shaquem is a big manager slash executive. Kendall Massenberg is the president of Motown. I was connected more than I even knew I was connected. Jimmy had a string of successes and hits. He would deliver talent that the record companies could propel to be major R&B, soul, pop, rap acts. By 2001, Jimmy had several commercial hits and multiple production deals with a variety of different labels, including the world-famous Motown Records. He had become known for his deal-making and his ability to negotiate, a skill that would help him permeate all facets of the entertainment industry. I feel indebted to Mike Tyson with my life. So when I come home, Mike is almost destitute. Don King, who had all of the belts at the time, wouldn't give Mike a title shot. I seized on the opportunity when Rockman knocked out Lennox Lewis. I call Barry Dickinson, who calls Farrakhan. We call in Henry Herbert Muhammad, who used to manage Muhammad Ali. We find out where Lennox is at, and all of us approach Lennox Lewis at the Trump International Hotel in Columbus Circle and tell him he's got to do the fight with Mike. The Tyson versus Lewis fight brought in $110 million in revenue, which still stands as one of the highest grossing pay-per-view events in history. He grossed over $30 million on that fight. Knowing his financial state at the time, I only took a million and a half enough that I repaid Mike for what he did for me when he really didn't have to do it. I made more money consulting record companies and doing side deals for different artists. Akon, Wyclef, Rick Ross. They would say, I want you to go and renegotiate my deal for me. Once the record company would see that I was hired to come in to renegotiate, they knew that it was going to be expensive. There was something attractive about his confidence and his swagger, the way he went after things. You felt like no one was going to take advantage of you. People used to think I would go in there with the gangster stuff, but no, I would just go in there with a high-powered lawyer. Despite Jimmy's continual success, he could never fully shake the shadows of his past. There was this fear of Jimmy because of this reputation that he had from being someone who dealt in the streets and handled things. Executives would get nervous. They didn't know if he was more of like a Suge Knight type personality. What he's known for in the streets, um, I think it has definitely uh, hindered his progression as a businessman. I should have been able to manage a Lady Gaga or a Britney Spears or Mariah Carey, but the only people I could pick up because of my reputation was the people down on their luck. You got guys like Gucci Mane who nobody would touch. The guy comes to my hotel room begging me. What do I do? I go sign Gucci Mane to Warner Brothers. I put Gucci on Mariah Carey and every other mainstream artist. I took this dude from nothing to something. And they still don't acknowledge my talent in the game. Despite the industry's resistance, Jimmy persisted to carve out his niche. In 2005, he encountered the game, a relatively unknown rap artist from Compton. They hit it off, and the game signed him as his manager. This would become his most lucrative management deal to date. Within a year, the game's first album, the documentary, goes platinum and has since sold over 5 million copies worldwide. In 2005, the game was nominated for BET's The Best New Artist Award and Billboard's Rap Artist of the Year. Jimmy had his very own superstar. My attorney, Jay Quattrini, was also Jimmy's business attorney. And I remember when Jay went to pitch him to some executives to run the urban music department, that their concern was his background and his reputation. And it was always very funny to us because we don't see that side of Jimmy. Like, Jimmy is really calm and mild-mannered. He's not arrogant. He's not anything that, that you would think that he would be if you just listen to the press. What I found myself doing was always proving myself over and over again. 
And I couldn't understand why, because I'm like, I had more hit records than a lot of these guys in the business, and they're being embraced and given opportunities. Those executives wasn't going into Compton to find game. Them executives wasn't going to Detroit to get Mario Wynan. Them executives wasn't going and talking to T.I. when they had a problem with him. And yeah, it took guys like me who understood the environment and the communities that they make all of the money from. But what I didn't know was that they would vilify me. After they asked me to be that guy who could straddle that fence and deal with the people they don't want to deal with. I think I've known Jimmy about 18 years now. And as he has matured, he's always been in a real life and death struggle with Jimmy Hinchman. And I remember uh, him saying to me that he really regretted that he ever invented that guy. I had to put out a press release stating, that is not my name, do not call me that anymore. I didn't like the connotations that came with it. It was hindering me from becoming who I wanted to become. My dream had always been to be corporate, to have a travel and expense account, to be on the board of something instead of just a consultant. And in 2007, Jimmy was finally given a shot at this dream. His success had put him on a short list to be the next vice president of Virgin Records' urban music department. A guy like me who comes from the projects of Brooklyn is being offered to run the rap department of Virgin Records. But the first thing when I go in for the meeting for the job, the exec look at me and say, this Jimmy Hensman name, oh my God. He said, it's a big landing. You come in the building, it's, it's whispers all over the place. Ultimately, Jimmy was not hired for the position. The then head of Virgin Record told him it was because of his reputation. He said he had never seen so many people hate and fear a man so much. And that made me just realize that I wasn't part of the good old boys club. I just knew where I stood at that point. And I was very disappointed, but I, I knew I had to keep working, keep doing what I do. That made me money and made me successful in my own terms. Discouraged by being passed over by Virgin Records, Jimmy broadened his business model and started producing television shows and films. He produced the original 50 Cent documentary, the national syndicated poker series Hip Hop Hold'em, and the movies Belly 2 and The Cookout 2. After I saw the success of Belly 2, and I saw that we only spent 700000 however it grossed over $8 billion at the time, I knew that that was the route that I really wanted to take. It was during this time that Jimmy got on the radar of reporter Chuck Phillips and assistant U.S. attorney Todd Kaminsky. His fortunes were about to change dramatically. America is based off of the rags to riches. I came from the worst of the worst. I was very ignorant. Listen, I, I did some terrible things when I was a kid. I don't even like to talk about those kind of things. But I admire the accomplishments I've made because I was a student to the mentors that had me, and I learned. Next time on Unjust Justice. Todd Kaminsky had made it known that he wanted me. He created an atmosphere for these guys to want to set me up. Todd Kaminsky came to see me in Miami. He showed me a picture with me and Jimmy in the club together. He committed by calling my child's mother and telling her, you know, saying that um, he gave me an offer, you know, saying that he can send me home. I traveled to see one in prison in Atlanta, and he was told he was promised all sorts of, you know, riches. If only he would cooperate against Jimmy. With Jimmy's case, I had personal knowledge of what the witnesses were saying. Witnesses in that case not only lied, but the government knew that they lied. <laughs>